we are, we are going to speak about uh, computation of discrete logarithms uh, during my talks. And uh, so I will try, uh, as far as I understand, part of the, mathemat of the, the audience has a mathematical background and the other not that much. So I will try to, to do something suitable for everyone. So if you think I'm going too slow, just tell me. If you think I'm going too fast, and tell me. And, and don't hesitate to ask questions as during Kenny's talk. And uh, it, it, should be, it should be nice. So just to let me know who, who is rather mathematically oriented in the audience. OK, so that's a minority. OK. So, so, okay, so if only you tell me that I'm going too slowly, <laughs> that's it. <a good. laughs> okay, so in order to make sure that I'm not going too fast, I'm going to use part, I'm going to use the board in, uh, in addition to my slides, and it would be, it would be better. So, uh, since we want to speak about this with logarithm, we are first going to recall what these are and uh, give some, some nice properties of the stuff. So, what we start with is a multiplicative group with a generator G. And uh, so if I, if I say that I have a generator, it means several things. So it means that my group is going to be cyclic. And, uh, and in fact, it's, going, it, it's also going to be commutative. So I'm going to take about, about well, some reasonably simple mathematical structures, this commutative group uh, with a cyclic structure. So one thing you want to know is whenever you have a group uh, given with a generator, but a cyclic group, what you know given such a group, and I'm all, all, all the time going to use uh, the, the multiplicative, well, most of the time going to use the multiplicative, you can't see. OK. So I will take black. And I can also try to write bigger, but if I write bigger on this small, uh, <laughs> it's OK. So OK, I have my group and my multiplicative operation. Can everybody see that? OK. So the thing you know, since you have a generator, it's a cyclic group, you know that, in fact, this is going to be isomorphic to some group of the form z over qz for some value q which is not necessarily prime, it's anything. Except that when you write it in this form, you usually use the additive notation. So when you write the structure of the group, you use the additive notation. OK? So why do I say that? Because usually when you come up in front of a mathematician and want to speak about the discrete log, just look at you and say, well, this is trivial. Uh, yes, this is trivial. You have a group, you know that it, it's isomorphic to this. And in fact, computing discrete logs, if you want to speak for a mathematician, is just making this isomorphism explicit and computationally effective. Okay. So what this means is you want to find a way to translate this group element into numbers modulo q, modulo the order of the group. And these elements are going to be the group elements. And everything that is going on there can be, uh, can be made completely, uh, well, can be translated in a completely equivalent way in the additive representation. So if you have two elements, G1 and G2 here, okay, and you have this isomorphism phi, what you know is that their images are going to be G1, phi of G1 and phi of G2. And if you take the product, <coughs> The image of the product is just going to be the sum of the images. And the inverse, the image of an inverse, is just going to be the opposite. The okay. And that's exactly what is happening with the ordinary log when you are just doing log computation. All the multiplication are translated <coughs> into additions. And, uh, well, and uh, the, lo the logarithm of the inverse of something is just the opposite, and that, that's it. OK? So and what we want to do when you want to compute discrete log, you want to do this in a fully effective and explicit way on your, on your computer. OK. And, uh, and it is the fact that we are taking cyclic group 
that gives you this specific kind of group here. If we were taking more complicated group, we would get something more complicated on the right hand also. For example, if you take an elliptic curve, in general, you get something slightly more complicated on the, on the right. Okay. So, uh, another way of looking at it is just saying that the map that computes discrete logs uh, is just the inversion of this, uh, of this map. So what, what is my, my map? Okay, assume that I'm taking one specific element here, which is going to be the element one. This is a very nice element because if, I, if you give me an element of this group z over qz, and you want to compute the log of this in basis one, you just need to divide the element by one, so it means that the log of something in this group, if you forget about all the rest, is just the value itself, which is kind of true. Okay? Uh, well, now, this map, since, it's in a, it, since it is an isomorphism, is going to be a bijection. So there will be going to be something, some antecedent <coughs> of one. So it's going to be J. And we will have phi of G uh, equal one. OK? So from this and from the group laws and everything, of g to the n is going to be n. Okay, so it's just two different ways of saying the same thing. Computing the discrete logs is just solving this problem if you want to be completely explicit. And if you want to speak to mathematician, it's making this isomorphism explicit. Okay. So, well, in general, it's something that's not easy to do. We are going to see some examples where it can be, well, sometimes it can be very easy. If you are taking uh, this group, then I, as I tell, told you in, uh, a few minutes ago, it's of course going to be very easy. But if you are taking a general group, well, you don't know, and, uh, and it, it, it's not going to be easy. And there are, in fact, some proofs in what is called the generic group model, where people prove that it's not going to be general if you don't have some, if you don't have some extra information about the way your group is represented. So if you just know, okay, I have a group and I know nothing about it. The only thing I know how, how to do is I, I'm able to call some subroutine. I don't know in which way they are working and these subroutines are going to multiply elements or invert elements. Then in this model, which is a generic group model, computing logs is going to be difficult. Okay, and we will see exactly how, how, much, how difficult they, it will be, but we will see that in the sequel. Okay, but of course, it's not because the problem is difficult that you can't try to solve it in the best way you can. Okay, and, and so what we are going to do now is, for the rest of the, of the week is to, we are going to take an algorithmic viewpoint, and we are going to say, okay, we have this hard problem of this discrete log computation, and we want to compute discrete logs. So what can we do? Well, it depends. If we don't know much about J, we can use generic algorithms, and we will see how effective they can be. I just t told you that they can't be very efficient, but still, we will look at them, because in some cases, they might be. And then, once you know more about the group, when you know how it is represented, you can try to use this knowledge and devise specific algorithms that are going to be much faster. OK, and this we will see, uh, we will see after. So for today, I'm going to start about the generic part, and then we will see if we, can, if we have time to do more or not. OK. So what kind of groups uh, have been in use in crypto? Well, we already heard about quite a lot during Kenny's talk. Uh, well, uh, initially, uh, in, the, uh, in the seminal paper of Diffie and Elman, what was essentially proposed was to work with integers module. This gives you a nice, uh, a, a nice group. Uh, well, the multiplicative group of integers will be a, a prime, because if you take the additive group, it's not very interesting. Okay. Um, it was quickly realized by everybody that you can do more than that and took an arbitrary finite field and work in any in the multiplicative group of any arbitrary finite field. And it took longer, but in the 80s, uh, people realized that you can use more complicated structures. In particular, you can work with uh, elliptic curves of the finite field. Well, if you look at the recent stuff, some people are even working 
with higher genus curve, mostly genus 2 curves. Okay. Uh, so you might ask why, if 2 is better than 1, why not go to 3, 4, or, or 11,000? Well, in fact, it is known that it's a bad idea to go to <coughs> 3, because things become more efficient than you, than you would expect. So we will just, anyway, in, in my talk, I will most, in, in, during this week, I will mostly speak of, about these two cases. Um, maybe there will be a couple of words on any pickers, but I won't go in. Okay. So, so no questions so far? Okay. So, I'm going to start with generic algorithms. Um, so, I, in the same context, I'm giving to you a multiplicative group with a generator. I tell you how you can perform the operation, but I don't give you any special information about the structure of the group, the representation, so you just know how to perform operation, and you want to compute uh, stuff in there. In there. Okay. Still, I'm going to give you a little bit more. I'm going to give you the cardinality of the group. I'm going to tell you how many elements there are in the group. Why do I do that? Well, mostly, because in all, uh, usually in all crypto protocols, um, people know the number of elements in the group. When you are doing DFLMAN, usually you know the number of elements. And when you are doing a discrete log based signature, it's often necessary to know the cardinality of the group to do it. So I will assume that the cardinality is given. I will even assume a bit more. I will assume that you know the factorization of the cardinality. Well, in some sense, this is a very strong assumption because the uh, cardinality of the group may be very large. Okay, and the, if it's large, there is no efficient way to factor it. <coughs> and if, if there is no efficient way to factor it, then there is no way I can know the factorization. Well, except that what I want to speak about now is what is going to happen if there are small factors. And if there are small factors in the cardinality, it's going to be easy to find them. So, it's not really a problem to, to do these assumptions for, for the moment. Okay. So, so now, what is well known and has been around in, in this thing of Polygelman, and it's sometimes also called the Silver Polygelman algorithm because the same idea was proposed by Silver around the same time. And what is well known is that to compute discrete logs in the group, <laughs> It suffices to be able to compute discrete logs in many small, smaller groups, which are going to be subgroups of the big one. And these smaller groups are, are going to have order, so size of the group, cardinality of the group, which is going to be uh, one of the prime in this data. Okay, so, um, does everybody know what a subgroup is? Yes? If someone doesn't know, yes? I know. So is there anyone who doesn't know? No? Okay. So, so since everybody knows what it is, it's going to be simple. Okay. So I have my big group okay, generated by this element. Okay. So what do you know, since this is a generator, you know that the order of this element is precisely the cardinality of it. Okay, so it means that if you raise this element to any arbitrary power, it will, it will always give you something different from one. Well, an arbitrary power bigger than zero, the zero is of course one. But if you raise to a power an integer bigger than, than zero, it's never going to be one until you reach a value which is the cardinality. Okay, so this is going to be one, and there is no smaller number than that. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider <laughs> this element for each of the primes that appear in the decomposition. I'm going to write gi equal g to the power cardinality of the group divided by the small prime I just selected. <coughs> So this element is going to be such that clearly g to the i 
to the power of pi is going to be one. This is very easy. Okay, so it means that this element g to the i, when you take all its power, it's going to give you a subgroup. So it's going to be a subgroup is just a subset which is stable by multiplication and inversion and contains one. And well, all the powers of, uh, of GI are clearly going to form a subgroup of the full group. And this subgroup, I'm going to call it GI, and it's going to be a group of size PI. Okay? And the, all these files are very easy. So now, uh, what I want to do is I want to take logs in many of, the, of such small groups. I'm trying to see how I can pass them together to get a full log in the big group. <coughs> okay, this, is, uh, this is the key idea of the, of the polygon algorithm. So to make things slightly simpler for now, let's just assume that all the exponents in the factorization are ones. That there are no multiple factors, okay? Or equivalently, that the cardinality of the group is square, free, whatever terminology you prefer. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to assume that I can just ask to some black boxes the logarithm in the subgroup G1, G2, G3, up to GK, and see how I can put them together to get a full log. In the, in the, in the full group. Okay? So remember, from the isomorphism we had between the group and the structural <coughs> copy z over qz, the discrete logs is going to be defined modulo q, modulo the order of the group. Okay? Because if you just take something <coughs> which is a, a correct value of the discrete log, you add q to it, it will be another different correct value for the same discrete. So the discrete log value is just defined modulo q. Okay. So we have some number. We want some number. So let's say y is going to be g to the x. And we want to find, we want x mod q. And now, so q is the cardinality of, and we know that q is a product of pi. Okay. So now what do we learn if we compute a log? What can we learn by computing a log in this group, in this group uh, gi? Well, from this, what I claim, which is very easy, is that if these two numbers are equal in the group, then y to the power y to the power cardinality of the group divided by pi is equal to g to the power x times cardinality of the group divided by pi. And by using uh, the very simple rules of algebra and the exponents, I can rewrite it as gi to the power of x. Okay, so it means that this element, which I, which I can call big y, uh, y, uh, y i, is going to be <coughs> gi to the power of x. Okay. And now if I get, if I am asking for logarithm in this group, okay, the best I can learn is the logarithm modulo the group order. So what I can learn by calling the discrete log subroutine, d log in group GI, so well, I mixed, uh, I mixed my notation, so, oops, what I can learn by ca calling the group, by calling D log in the group GI, what I can learn is <coughs> X modulo PI. Okay, so now can someone tell me 
if I can collect all the value of x, modulo all the pi, is it then possible to recover x mod q? So, anyone has a keyword for me? Chinese yes, Chinese reminder theorem. Or CRT, yeah. Uh, but uh, you have the order of pi to some power. Yeah, I, I said for, the, for now I'm going to assume that there are no, the powers are all one. OK, I'm going to see after how to do that with, with powers. OK, I just wanted to, to deal with the simple case first. OK, so if you don't have powers, then you get all these, and, and you get x mod, uh, mod q by the CR. OK, now if there are powers, what do I need? If there are powers, here. Before being able to apply the CRT, I need to find this value here. Okay. But the thing is, uh, now, just doing a call in this group of order PI is clearly not going to give me this. So now I have a question uh, which I need to solve. If, assume, if you assume that PI to the EI divides Q, how can you find x modulo pi to the EI? Okay. And clearly, it cannot be done doing a single call to the discrete log in this. Simply for information theoretic num uh, reasons, you are going to get a number which is too short. It's cannot, it cannot encode the correct answer, it's just too short. And clearly, to encode the correct answer, the correct answer here, you need many values of this law. And you expect that by collecting EI different value, maybe you should get all the information there is to get. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to assume that there is a larger power of PI. And I'm going to look how I can do several calls to the discrete log in this small group to extract a little part by little part this complete log. And if I can do this, then I know that I will be able to use the Chinese reminder CRM to pass everything together, and uh, it will be okay. Okay? Okay. So just for simplicity, now I can assume that I am in a group whose cardinality is just the power of a prime. Okay, I have used my conversion from the big group to a group of order p to, the, to some exponent. And now I'm going to look in this group uh, whose order is a prime power, what I can do. Okay? So in this group, I want to solve y equal g to the x. And I'm going to rewrite this as y equal g the sum of i equals 0 to e minus 1 of x i p to e i. So I'm just going to, de to decompose my exponent, so what the value I want to find, which is a number modulo p to the e. I'm going to decompose it in basis p. Okay, so usually in uh, computer science you do everything in basis 2, but here you are going to do it in basis Okay, and now from this basis P, we want to extract the digit, the digit of this number. We, we want to do something to find the digit of the number one value. Okay, so, so the first digit, x0, is going to be very easy to get. It is just the previous attack, the, the previous reduction we have. So what you are going to do is you are going to let big Y equal uh, little y to the power P e minus 1. Okay. And this is going to be g to the power uh, <coughs> okay. and clearly all the terms for <coughs> i bigger than 1 are going to have a p to the e as a common factor. And well, g to the power p to the e is 1. So this is just going to be g to the power p to the e minus 1 to the power x0. 
So this is going to be a discrete logarithm problem in my group of order. So just by doing one call to the subroutine or to the oracle, you just get x0. And once you have x0, you want to carry on and find x1, x2, x3. Okay, so I'm going to show how you can find x1, and it will be very easy to, to do the recursion in your head. Okay, so to find x1, once I know x0, I'm going to write y1 equal y over g to the x0. So this is going to be g to the power of sum from 1 to e minus 1 of x i p i. So it's exactly the same power, except that the first term of the sum has been removed. Okay, so now that I know that, I'm just, just going to raise everything, but this time to the power p to the e minus 2. And by doing exactly the same trick, this is going to be g to the p e minus 1 to the power of x1. And then you get x1. And then you do it again and again and again, getting rid of one of the terms of the sum at each step and raising to a to smaller and smaller and smaller power. And that's it. OK, so this way, you can com fully compute discrete logs in the full group by doing exactly EI calls to, to the discrete logarithm in each of the subgroup GI. OK? So this is not very difficult. <coughs> and what does it mean in practice? Well, in practice, it means that, well, you have, if you assume some, some kind of homogeneity and just forget about the exponents and everything, just what, what happens in the general case, if things are not too de de degenerate, what is going to happen is that the discrete log in the big group G is going to be as hard as the discrete log in the largest subgroup of prime order. Okay, all the small primes are going to be easy to deal with, and it's the largest one which is going to dominate uh, the complexity. Yes? What do you mean by homogeneity? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, if you, what I mean is if, if the cardinality of the group is 2 to the 10,000 times 3, then it's clearly going to cost more to do the, the 10,000 call to discrete log mode 2 than the 1 call to discrete log mode 3. But this is a completely degenerate case. If you assume that the multiplicity are not too big or whatever, then uh, what is really going to dominate is, uh, is the largest prime. OK, but if you make a very generic statement, and there are mathematicians in the room, they will come up with this stupid counterexample, which is, which is perfectly correct, but we don't care about it. <coughs> OK. So, so now the question is what happens if the cardinality of the group is prime? That's the next natural question. Since we know that this is the hardest case, so we want to focus on, on group of prime order. Oh. So, and what is well known for these kind of groups of prime order is that they are <coughs> algorithms whose complexity is square root of the size of the group. Well, so in the I, I write big O of square root. Uh, what I'm going to show you is probably big O tilde of square root. So does anyone know or don't know the difference between big O and big O tilde? I assume the silence meaning that we don't know. Someone knows or don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so who knows the difference between O and O tilde? Okay, and who doesn't? Okay, and the rest uh, just didn't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when you say big O of something, it just means that uh, the complexity is given by some function which is smaller than some multiple of what is inside the group. And when we say big O till, it's say, okay, this is almost true, but there might be some additional 
fact, or logarithmic in the, in the function which is inside. But since it is a mess to deal with this logarithmic, logarithmic factor, we just hide them. That's OK, and the way I'm going to present things, there will be hidden logarithmic factor. So one of the things I, I'm going to ask you in, well, during the next few, not slides, <coughs> next few boards, uh, is going to tell me when you see a hidden logarithmic factor. This will keep you awake. OK. So, so I have this problem, y equals b to the n, and I want to find n in time which is going to be not to be, which is going to be of the order of square root. OK, so since n is defined mod b, n is smaller than b. Uh, since n is smaller than p and I want to have small numbers, well, I want, okay. One very natural thing, which is very similar to what I did previously, is to say, okay, maybe it would be a good idea to write n in basis square root of p. Well, maybe you have an objection. No objection? Well, I have one, actually. Uh, this is not going to be an integer, so, well, so this might be an integer, maybe, but there is no way this can be one. Okay, so I want to do something which shows that my numbers are integer. Okay, but okay, remember we want the complexity to be of the order of big O of square root of p, so we don't care if something is a little bit bigger. So, just round this. Okay, so this is easy and well, to avoid writing this all the way, I'm going to give it a name. So this is going to be big R. So what I want to find now is I want